Hey, everybody. Coach Hughes here from the Be Best You podcast. Uh, you always hear the tagline. It's kind of funny put in there, but the tagline is Be Best You because really no one's going to follow a mess. I have to say it, but it's, uh, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, I, uh, I'm really excited to have on uh, today's podcast and be able to have a conversation with Robert Glazer. Hello, Robert. How are you, sir? Thanks for having me. Um, Robert is an author of uh, several books. I'll let him kind of talk a little bit about those, but uh, I found him in um, looking at, you know, working on and building on teams. How do you do that? And I found the word uh, elevate really drew me because it's uh, a part, a very key word of a manifesto of the company that I work with. So I was drawn to that. And then I got into the book and very quickly realized that actually it's kind of a funny story. I, I read it and I went, wait, this guy wrote the book that I want to write. And it wasn't that I knew what you knew. It was just really exciting because everything that you put down in this book, which you actually refer to as a roadmap almost, is kind of the roadmap that I've kind of tripped over, fell into, and kind of have uh, end up creating in a leadership week that I have. And what it helped me do is kind of almost validate what we are doing is what uh, a best-selling book is advising other companies to do. And some of the stuff that that we were doing, you've, I've, I see that I can take those things to the next level. There's a couple of things there that are uh, roadblocks and things like that on the right, on the way that I can, I can uh, learn from, but uh, I, I haven't stopped sound, you know, since I got it and been sharing it uh, with as many people as I want. So well done on this. And it's a, uh, it's an awesome, awesome tool. Very. And I think another big key of it is, uh, and I wrote down some key words, which I love is, you know, a lot of people are afraid to share because if you share your best ideas, maybe your competitors will take that and steal it and do them better than you. But you actually talk about that in there. And, you know, true leaders will share their best practices without fear. Um, and uh, I, I got to give you a lot of credit for that, because there's a lot of people who would hold on to a lot of this stuff so that they can have the ed competitive edge. But you've taken the high road, I think, and in sharing a lot of these best practices. So any company, any team would, would benefit from it. So I, I applaud you on 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 that uh, on that front. Um, Thanks. There's a difference between having the knowledge and then choosing to to prioritize it, right, uh, from an organization. And I think a, a lot of this stuff is, you know, I come from the school of of doing it, like, you know, not not an academic, not theory, what has worked in reality, you know, 20 years of building and, and leading people now. And there's just a lot of common best practices that I've learned over years, and I've seen in high performing organizations, again, that not, nothing in not, not, not to not to not sell my nothing here is new. I, the way I learn too is when someone recapsulates something for me in a framework that makes it so I can use it and access it and otherwise. And I think that's what this book is. And I think it just comes at a time where uh, the growth for growth sake organization is is probably on the shelf for for a little while. Um, you know, and and now it's like even growth is a little bit of a dirty word because I think people are really tired and exhausted. But look, businesses grow. We're going to get back to growth. I just think it's going to have to look in a different way and, and a way that brings the people along that the analogy that I think encapsulates the book that seems to resonate with people is that if NASA declared that it was going to send a, a, a spaceship to the, to the moon and that spaceship landed on the moon and all the astronauts were dead. I don't think everyone would be jumping up and down saying that like that was a super successful mission, yeah. but it's something has happened with that and company building in the last decade where it's like, it, it's just like, get the th object to the goal, like irrespective of like what happens along the way. Yeah. It's funny to say, cause I, I, uh, I have my wife and my daughter have diagnosed me with uh, two conditions that can be combined uh, sarcasm and passive aggressive or sarcastic, passive aggressive, or I can get ugly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not, it's not meant to be that, but I always talk about how, you know, a lot of why you're, you're trying to figure something out. And I actually use the moon as my example. I say, you know, a lot of people want to go to the moon and they're like, yeah, okay. So you're doing all the stuff to go to the moon, but guess what? Someone's been there before. So have you talked to them yet? And they're yeah. like, well, wow. I'm like, well, what the hell are you doing? You know, talk to those guys first. And uh, that's, that's what you've done. You know? Yeah. I don't, I don't believe in actually anyone has a stealth company. I'm always like that company. The more I've seen more of them go out of business where they're, they're living in a closet. They're not talking to people. Their friends not telling them that there's another team doing the same thing down the road. If, yeah. if sharing your idea gives away all the proprietariness of it, it's not that proprietary. People have yeah. the same ideas. Well, I think too, and if not mistaken, when you started a company, um, Accelerate, which is kind of a cool word. I mean, 
I'm turning more into a word, not a wordologist, but I'm uh, getting more into the etymologies of words and studying it. I'm not a writer, but I'm, I'm going to get a book out of me once. But I know that your your intention was never to write books in per se. I think your intention was to build your company and in discovering you know, that process through trial and error mistakes and all those things you you know, I think the book is a result of that. Uh, is that fair? Yeah, uh, yeah. And discovering, you know, realizing that when I figure something out, if it can make things better, like that's my why and my dominant core value and sort of purpose is share ideas that help people and companies grow. So um, if I figure something out, and I think it can make things better. I inherently want to outsource it or crowdsource it. Like I that's I'm sort of a do tinker, figure out cause and effect. And then like, hey, everyone, like, look, check this out. It, it works and helps. And like, look, I, I look at what's going on in the world today with politics and polarization and otherwise, like, you know, these, these things will not make a better product necessarily a company, but like, I, you know, improving the company, improving the culture, growing the team. I, I think leadership, better leadership is the biggest chance we have to make a real difference in society. Like we are not going to get it from our politicians and our elected leaders. Like, yeah. Our, our our best chance is getting it from our, our our organizations and our leaders, both for profit and nonprofit. Yeah. And and you you mentioned core values here for a second. I have to laugh because when you were describing your personal, when you were describing your relationship with your wife, I was like, oh my God, uh, that's mine. I'm the same way where it's very combustive, by the way, the combination that we have. So be, be careful. Well, it, it, well, my my wife and I actually work together, uh, which is kind of interesting. And one of the things that you may, she has been telling me very nicely and coaching me through it. But uh, sometimes she gets upset with me because I'm this visionary and I have all these ideas. And even when we get to a point where the idea that she had heard is done, I'm like, yeah, but we're not done. She's like, well, yeah. it's never and i laugh please, because please don't make it better that's what I'm yeah i love that how you said that <laughs> but but you said you learned and i think that's a part of it the beginning of your process i believe with this to elevate is just, that's why the be best you to me is important is you can't build an organization if you don't start with yourself and i think your first book which i didn't get um yeah. i didn't start with and which i will get you if i'm correct in that you speak about personal elevation and development in that book, and then you go yeah. to the team, right? So start yeah, same, with- same same framework, right? Elevate your team is like, how, how do we put these principles rather than from an individual leader or people on a team, how do we put them into the organization and into the culture? Because it's this framework of four capacities, which I think is, is fundamentally a framework for how we get better. And if you look at an organization or a person, you can see where they're where they're out of whack and and you know understanding values to me is the foundation again build the house like you're not going to make good decisions if you build them out of alignment with with values and so when you're talking about elevating leaders at your organization i spoke at a company recently and they had kind of like here's they gave us here's our kind of standard thing that we expect of leaders and and you know when when i when i was speaking to them i said Look, this is these are the behaviors and the practices that the company wants, but no one is telling you there is one type of leader. Like the best level five leadership comes from a huge sense of self awareness mm-hmm. uh, and, and and sort of humility and leading from your your strengths. And y- if you aren't clear on that, they are driving you today as a leader. You just might not be clear. I, I've seen enough of these moments where someone I talk about a few in a book kind of has an epiphany break on their values, and they're like, "Holy crap, this is." I've been overcompensating for this in my marriage, in my workplace, in my whatever. Like, and I just didn't even know how to explain it to anyone. Then when you know that and you go out and you're like, look, something like trust is really important to me. And like, if you lose trust on my team, like it's really hard to get it back. Like that's, that person is just telling people the truth. And, Mm -hmm. and, and they're, I don't, again, there's not one leadership style. I think we all lead from our, our values and our experiences we don't have enough clarity in order to be able to tell the people around us what, what those are in most cases. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, the be best you, no one's going to follow a mess. You know, we start with, uh, well, you know, we had the wheel of life. I remember I got a great one from Darren Hardy. He wrote the compound yeah. effect. My wife and I end up, she, she followed Oprah. And then we looked at, um, you know, all the different ones and we created what we call our in light view. And rather than using the circle, we just use a graph and yeah. uh, a gentleman by the name of Dan Thurman, uh, wrote a book called Off Off Balance on Purpose, meaning that everyone's trying to have a balanced life. You actually refer to it indirectly here that everybody feels like having a balanced life is the goal. And it's, yeah, it's really hard life. 
<laughs> right? It's balanced. It, it's movement. integration, right? It's it's yeah. it's 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 like a portfolio. It's not a it's not a teeter totter. It's a portfolio. The pieces all fit in nicely. Like I had an all family week last week. Like I did college tours with my son. I visited my daughter at college. Then I spent some yeah. time with my parents, and I got nothing else done. Mm-hmm. And then this week, a couple of days, I had buried in work and at a conference and otherwise. Like and and so. I just, I want a, a life or a work life that allows me to have all those pieces. They will not all be in the same time, particularly depending on your time frame. Right. So you have, um, you, well, let me, the other one is, uh, I'll get to capacity in a second, but you already referred to your four, um, uh, you know, your four core values. Elements, yeah. Yeah. Elements, yeah. Call them elements. So we, we talk about core values and different stuff like that, but can you, um, can you share first of all with you'll, you'll learn them in the book but maybe yeah how you can uh, let me let me them. yeah let me define them first actually how i define sure. them and elevate and then i'll kind of give the business context so spiritual capacity uh is and, and sort of capacity building is just how we get better it's a method how we get better and imagine there's four quadrants and if they're growing in tandem and it's bigger and in mass and it's a ball rolling down the hill it's gonna faster harder great if one of these things is huge and the other's tiny it's gonna bounce all over the place so Spiritual capacity is not religious. It's about understanding who you are, what you want most, and the standards you want to live by. Again, for most of us, that's our core value. That's our strengths, the things we're good at. We're good at. Intellectual capacity is how you improve your ability to think, plan, uh, learn, and execute with discipline. So think of this as your personal operating system. That's why someone's listening to this. Is there a tidbit that they can take away from this discussion today that they can do something better tomorrow with less energy and less aggravation. It's not about more, right? A better operating system runs something kind of faster and smoother. Uh, Physical capacity is your health, well-being, and physical performance. And then emotional capacity is how you react to challenging situations, your emotional mindset, and the quality of your relationships. So in the work sphere, a couple of things change, right? In spiritual capacity, it's about helping other people on the team figure out what their values are, what they're good at, what their strengths are, so they can play to those and they can kind of share with those. Intellectual, it's creating a culture that's really good at learning and feedback and you know, making sure that people are, 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 are getting better and improving and not making the same mistakes. Um, and again, they're cultural attributes of that. Physical capacity, again, are, are, we, are we at least net neutral on people's physical well-being and not hurting it because a lot of bad managers do that? Are we, are we creating the separation, particularly with everyone working from home, that, that people need to have some rest and relaxation and time outside of work and feel like they're coming to work energized? Yeah. And then emotional, um, again, are, from a cultural standpoint, are we focusing on the things that we can control? Are we modeling psychological safety and vulnerability so that we can have that, you know, feedback? Are we kind of modeling positive relationships? And these are, these are things that spill across people's personal and professional life. But you don't wake up late, you know, you are not someone who wakes up late at home, skips the alarm, is kind of an absolute mess, can't balance their checkbook walks into the work and suddenly is like a whiz at budgets and is wide awake. Like we are the same person. And for all the companies that are doing hybrid work, remote work right now, literally you're kind of logging on from home. So some of these things are are holistic, right? When you think about physical capacity, like good habits and giving people the space, not telling them what to do, but if, you know, to eat well and exercise and do things that we know improve your physical and mental you know, capacity and sort of talking about those in the workplace and making those a priority for people from a holistic standpoint. I mean, I, I mentioned this, but, you know, we've had employees that run a marathon or a triathlon or something. They need to train during the day. Like if you have an employee running a triathlon or marathon, they will be at peak mental performance. Like you should let them run and train, like go, go have them do some work after they ran at their heart rate for 160 you know, uh, beats per minute for an hour, like they're actually energy levels can be totally different than someone was on zoom for three hours. So I, I just look at these things from a more integrated kind of long game fashion than I think some people do. Well, okay. So you look at, you know, old, you know, the, the way business is done today, you know, 20 years, 30, 40 years ago, um, you know, there was a whole different mindset uh, approach today. Uh, it's about the, the whole person invent, you know, investing in, so bottom line people, they hear that. Okay. Um, you know, it's business. We need to make money. And, and you're asking me, I guess, here's the question. I see a lot of people think this is a good idea, but they have a hard time quantifying 
because they want that short-term return on that investment. You know, they don't yeah. see, they don't short see term. Short, short term is never right. Short-term returns usually sacrifice long-term returns. So look, I talk a lot about in the book about focusing on outcomes and the right things. And, but there is an 80, 20 rule that we just can't get around. And a lot of these companies that, you know, want everyone to work really hard, but haven't don't have clarity around goals and rules and norms and values and their people are burnt out and they're turning over and they can't keep people like those are real issues that have a real cost. Um, yeah. I have sort of an anti case study in the book from, you know, Marissa Meyer, but that didn't work out very well. It worked out really well for her. She got like $200 million, but yeah. Doing 52 acquisitions, having everyone work, like it didn't actually create any value for the company. Like if you look at all the data, if you look at organizations that focus on, when you're just frenetic, when you're focused on the wrong thing, when you're focused on people just, you know, being there and working 12 hours a day as they're kind of like sending their resume everywhere else, I, I don't see how you're going to get good outcomes. Look, I am not, you've, you've read the book. This is not, I, I'm not a fluffy, no outcome. We We operate in a super high performance cutthroat industry. We have standards we have goals those things are shared publicly like if you're red on your metrics for three quarters in a row like there's going to be a discussion but by the way your metrics were really clear and the outcome that your department needed was really clear and was shared with everyone and it's not about how many hours you worked or when you worked it's are you getting the outcome we all understand this in sales we're really good at this in sales no one hires salesperson a that works 100 hours a week and sells $20,000 when salesperson B works 30 hours a week and sells $100,000. Like we know how to value outcomes. We don't say, well, you know, just make more calls. Like we say, no, that's that's the outcome. But a lot of the organizations don't have an outcome. You, you ask a bunch of people, what are your top three things you're supposed to get done this year? Like uh, there's some there's some real basic discipline stuff that needs to be combined with some of the stuff that I talk about in this book. No, it's great. It's a great, you know, mirror way to look at it. And I kind of laugh too. So if anybody has a dirty closet, you refer to this and uh, I am. So one of the things that bothers me is I walk in my closet and I'm like, Oh, and then uh, the 80, 20 rule is so true. I wear 20% of the clothes. It's 90, 10 in clothes. If anyone <laughs> ever doubts it, right. Your clients. And it's also, if you always think about 10% of your 20% of your problems, 80% uh, <laughs> of your problems are from 20% of the people. Yeah. yeah, we wear, I go to buy something new and I'm like, what is, how's this? My wife's like, it's great. It looks like everything else is in your closet. Like, <laughs> yeah, there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of charities getting bags of clothes after you read this, because it's exactly what I did to my closet. I, I literally, uh, in, I, I read the book, I take notes and then I, I try to listen to, you know, different parts of it to clarify. And, uh, yeah, go put some tape, like keep a, everyone on this. If you want to understand the 80, 20 rule, <laughs> put some scotch tape in your closet. And every yeah. time you wear something, put, put, the piece of tape on that hanger and put it yeah. back there or put it in the drawer or, yeah. or put tape on all the stuff and only take tape off the ones you wear. It, it's, it's 2080 and, and, and all these organizations have 2080, but there's so much frenetic energy and running around all the stuff that people aren't even working on the right things. No. And it's interesting too, on the, on the other, other extreme, you know, you get somebody who buys the same color pants and, you know, you, you think that's kind of weird, but there's a genius to same color pants every day. Two yeah. color is a white shirt you don't have one more decision not to think about yeah right? one, and and you know i'm add i have no problem saying that in other podcasts i mentioned that and yeah. or have add i'm not add and i have a son with autism oh, I'm with and you. I, yeah and i learned uh i learned that early when he was diagnosed i i said my son's autistic and a very kind lady said no he's what's his name his name is jt she was he has autism yeah. and, I, and i learned a lot because uh a lot of the people i work with probably have it and they do or they probably do and and they feel like that's who they are i'm like no no use that as your superpower uh um and uh but yeah the 80 20 rule that's hey if you buy the book and you don't get anything else out of it that's uh what is it 14 dollars. you'll have a clean closet for sure <laughs> yeah i'm not uh what's her name the woman who does all the you know clean up your stuff it's not yeah it's not me, but yeah, it, 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 it's hard to get around. So I See, think you never knew, you never knew that, you know, you, that's how you help somebody out right there. So exactly. I, I, I appreciate You're the first it. person to tell me they cleaned their closet out after reading that anecdote. <laughs> but I, I use that today, actually, because uh, today in my lesson was leader versus manager. And um, the first thing comes up, do you spend 80% of your time on 20%? You spend 80% on 50 and 80% on 80. And, you know, young managers are, you know, they're, uh, you know, if you're spending 80% of your time on 20% of the people who are doing 20% of the work, you're, you know, you're wasting your time. Um, right. 
you know, and then it's interesting too. There was a gentleman that I learned years ago and um, he wrote a book called sending flowers to the living. And he, and he refers to rising stars, shooting stars and anchors and yeah. rising stars. People think, Oh, give that guy all, or that person, all the uh, knowledge and, and input you can, the right, the shooting stars are only going to be here for a while. So don't invest too much in them. And then, you know, the anchors, let's hold on to them as long as we can. And what I tell her, I go, the, certainly the rising stars you do that with. Uh, but the shooting stars, you do the same thing because some of them might not go. Yeah. Um, and you have, uh, you you use three other examples of, of that kind of uh, thing in there, which I love as well. A little different um, yeah. description. But um, if you can speak to those three different types of uh, groups of people. Yeah, so you're talking about the... Um, the, the uh, yeah. Oh, I, <laughs> the oh goodness the uh, you're talking about the i know you're talking about the catch number. and release that, catch, that part yeah sorry yeah sorry sorry, sorry. Yeah. so yeah. star Brain stifler forward. catch and release and two meritocracy yeah so i just want to make sure we were talking about the right thing we are yeah, sorry about that so a star stifler is the first organization that i worked at coming out of college where i worked with these incredible people and there was this incumbent group that just like figured out how to master their job and had very little external value, high internal value, figure out the politics, like, like star stifling are, are threatened by people that are up and coming, right? They're like a threat to their job because they're not growing the organizations. And so there's no new seats. And so these people are threat. And so usually all the people leave and that organization went bankrupt, but like everyone I worked with has done something incredible, like, and probably all of those people I worked with would have been a better leader of that organization than, than the ones that we had. Um, so, so catch and release, you know, I think Patty McCord of Netflix sort of made this, uh, a, a little, the, this term famous. So this is where we're going to, we're going to train, you know, this is the adage, the CEO and the CFO, well, what if we train them and they leave? And the CEO says, well, what if we don't and they stay? So this is, this is the organization that, you know, like yours, they, we train people, like we, we build them up and then we realize, you know what, they, we might not have the right role for them or they want to be a CFO and they're ready and we have a CFO and they're not going to go anywhere. Well, you know, we, we're, you're okay with them going, you, you make them the best they can be and help build their capacity. And then you're okay if they go out in the world and, 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 and have their talent somewhere else. Now, you don't want this to be a regular thing where you're like, you know, if you're Jersey Mike's and you're like building the management team at Subway, like this is not what yeah. you want, right? You're probably <laughs> doing something wrong. So the last one of this is is true meritocracy. And I let me just say, I don't think an organization could be a true meritocracy all the time. I think it would be disruptive, but this is the best person at any time gets moved up and takes the seat. There's no politics. There's no nothing. Like it would be, it would be the most capable person is at, at any time. And um, I know some people don't like sports analogies, but uh, I have to use one here because I think it's it's appropriate. So, you know, in, in 2001, uh, New England Patriots had signed their franchise quarterback, Drew Bledsoe, to a $100 million uh, contract. A couple games into the season, he's the face of the franchise. He gets hurt, knocked out. This gawky sixth-round draft pick comes in and plays, like, really well for six games, and the team rallies around him. And Bill Belichick, the coach of the Patriots, had always had a mindset of like, I don't care what round I draft you in. They've had an undrafted free agent like make the team for the last 15 years. I don't yeah. care what we pay you. I don't care what I like. The best person plays on the field. He has a, he doesn't have any sunk cost fallacy. It's a pure meritocracy organization. And so after the six games, when Drew Bledsoe came back, he's ready for a starting job. He's like, no, I think we're going to go with this skinny, lanky six round pick, you know, who was Tom Brady. So you, you can kind of imagine like either there were two outcomes there. Tom Brady was this hall of fame winning quarterback for another team, or he never got a shot and, and sort of relished on the, on the bench somewhere. So I think, I think a lot of organizations, you know, need to play that role in some point and say, you know, do we, if we have this really incredible talent that we built up and we don't make room for them and we don't put them there uh, again, they're going to go. Yeah. You know, especially if you're coming from a place of building people up, elevating them and they get a skill and, and then you hold on to them because you don't want them to go and take what you taught them uh, yeah. or what they learned while they were there. Obviously, you know, they, they you got to give them credit for that. And, you know, and that fear, it goes back to something you said earlier. And I remember, I don't know who it said, right, but I always remember leaders are communicators in a sense where managers are are uh, not Ask in in good. a way where information is held onto out of power or fear, meaning if I know something you don't, 
I have leverage or I know something and I teach you, you do it better, you lose. So I'm not going to tell you. That's kind of what I earlier when I mentioned that. I love how you're, you know, how you're sharing, how you're operating your company, which yeah. other people may say, well, you're giving your competitive edge away. But leaders communicate in the sense that they inform to empower people. And I don't know where yeah, I heard leaders that. want to create more leaders, right? Yeah. And I think that's the that's the fundamental thing. I, I do the I still do all the new employee cultural onboarding at our organization and i always ask people sort of compare and contrast or stories of the cultures they came from or what have they seen sure. like honestly and one person told me and this was a company at the time we had hired like seven or eight people from we had actually gotten to a feud with them they're like stop poaching our people and like our people your people are all calling us like i'm, yeah. I'm gonna answer the phone like yeah. <laughs> that's a that's your problem not our problem yeah. um so they clearly that's wrong and when i said the, the, to someone like what's what have you noticed in your first couple of weeks that this this gentleman said I, everyone is reaching out offering help showing me things at my old company if you knew something you kept it to yourself because that's your competitive advantage if you have a culture or an organization where people see the competition as other employees and not this is like friendly fire you know and not people outside the organization you have like a huge problem at your yeah. company yeah it's interesting. So there's a gentleman in our, my industry named Jim Sullivan, and he wrote two books. One's called Fundamentals, and it's just about that. And it's maybe the number one kind of go-to quick handbook in, in the industry. And he wrote another book called uh, Multi-Unit Leadership. And we were chatting last week, and he said, he goes, you know, you can design your culture, core values, your mission statement, you know, map it all out, do all that stuff. He goes, but your culture is the people that are in the culture. Right. So- that that culture is what you reward at the end of the day, right? Yeah. So and, and Ron had integrity and respect and all these things as their culture. What they really rewarded was backstabbing and risk taking. <laughs> and if you looked at where the money went and stuff, like it's not what you're saying, it's what you're actually the behaviors that you're rewarding. So if you reward ruthless competition, that's your culture, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. And and it's interesting too, because the other second thing that Jim said to your point as well, and it goes a lot is, you know, we don't have a a, a a hiring problem or turnover problem we have a leadership problem yeah and and, and uh i think you, you know a big part of your book and and uh, again chapter seven was the the chapter where you have your uh your uh key catch and release part but the other part is is training people up to well training people for the job that you think they're going to yeah. do later on um and that's that where the holistic stuff comes in i was speaking with someone this morning we don't train people on leadership stuff. Usually he's, he said, he said something like the data is you first start leading in your twenties and you get your first real training, like 15 years later. Like, I don't, I don't know what it was, but he had done some research. And he was telling me that like, again, how do you have a difficult conversation? How do you do, how do you prioritize? What is the 80, 20, like, what are all of these holistic management and leadership things that by the way, are probably very similar in your personal life. How do you prioritize? How do you have a good morning routine? How do you not, Look, there's plenty of micro man. There's a large correlation between micromanaging managers and helicopter parents, right? It is it is the same uh, problem applied in a different context. Yeah, and again, your book kind of speaks, uh, you know, you know, to that. Um, you know, you just think about. Uh, well, I, I have a, one of my slides is I throw up a Ferrari, and I don't know how much a Ferrari costs. I'm a, I'm a Volkswagen bug guy. Uh, sure. 68. I got my dream car, 1968 Volkswagen Bug. So I'm definitely not a hot rod guy. And, and, um, you know, I say what, 350,000, 400. I go, that's typically what a restaurant would cost to open up. And how many of you guys drive? And they all raise their hand. How many of you guys would like to drive a car like that? Most people, some people don't surprisingly. And then yeah. I say, who's driven a car like that? And got four or five. I go, is that car drive like any car? And they're like, and I go through a whole analogy of everybody wants to drive the hot rod. So we put them yeah. in the car and then they crash and then we blame them. And yeah. um, I think that's the thing. It's why do managers learn how to manage in that role? Why do leaders learn how to lead when they're leading? And I think through your book, what you, you reiterate is something that I really feel is a thousand percent um, correct, but almost a hundred percent not done. And that's train people to be leaders when that's not even on their radar. Yeah, uh, give them give them give them some exposure. We have these more management forms. Here's another thing that's in the book that we talk about. A lot of them shouldn't lead or don't want to lead or it's not their mindset, right? If they're a production oriented salesperson and you 
turn them into a sales leader when you should have just given them a higher quota. Like leading's not, you have, when you move from a, 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 a doer, an individual contributor to a leader, you have to change your entire reward center. It is no longer about, hey, hey, coach, you did a great job. It's about, coach, your team's doing a great job or your team's not doing a good job. And that's where you feel good. It's not about your production. And I don't think I said this in this book, but you know, one of the things is like, companies don't evaluate leaders on, on leadership. They evaluate leaders on individual performance metrics, which is like a total like bug in the system. Like you yeah. should be evaluating your leaders on if they're leading well and their teams think they're leading well. And people, again, the difference between a leader and manager, there's so many, but like people have to work for a manager. They want to work for a leader. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So I think sports coaching, um, you know, I asked too the whole class who played sports, who was captains. A lot of them were captains. Not a surprise. You're a manager of a business. Yeah. Um, my daughter, though, was a soccer player, and I was a different type of leader on the field. Um, on some teams, I was the best. Some teams, I wasn't. But my daughter had a talent level where she was typically the best on every team. I was very frustrated with not frustrated. Tried to be a good dad, and and I was and I had a this girl Christy Rampone, captain of his women's soccer team. We happened to know and. And I went to her one day, I said, my daughter, Mickey just doesn't, her name's Michaela. She doesn't get in huddles. She doesn't talk. And, yeah. and Christy said, let her find her voice first. But um, what happens to your, to, in your book, and you mentioned it too, and you just said it is the best performers, the guys who are the best athletes, strongest, they become the leaders by proxy almost. Yeah. And, and they don't. And then we wonder why they fail. And it's really, we've kind of failed them because we didn't evaluate them in the leadership role. Right. Try, try them out. Give them the training. Yeah. Have the discussion. Do you like this? Do you want an opt out? Do you want to go back? Do you really want to become a sales leader and learn how to become a sales coach and do all of that stuff? Or do you just want to sell more? Yeah. That, there, there's, that's a very individual thing, right? The first person might say, I just wanted to make more money. And I thought this was the only option. And the yeah. second person might say, you know what? Like, really, like, I'm I've done the selling thing. Like I'm ready to move on to training others. Like they, I, I don't think there's a single answer to that. No, you know, and then it's like everyone sees this shiny leadership book and the cover is really good. And you get the first chapter and you're like, this is awesome. And the third, you yeah, should do a don't lead. You don't want to. Or something yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. But they never get to chapter 15 where you're firing your brother or you're, you know, you have to, you know, yeah, do these things. Yeah, I'll, and avoid the sweaty palm conversations that uh, you have to yeah, Steve, you have to Steve Jobs said, it, what did Steve Jobs said? If you want, uh, I'm going to totally butcher this, but he said, yeah. <laughs> oh, if you want everyone to like you, don't be a leader, sell ice cream. Like that was the, <laughs> hey, <laughs> that was what it was. No. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, a couple. I don't want to keep it too long. And, and I know the attention span of our audience is a little shorter, but I, I, um, your book is definitely a roadmap. You have several resources, which I think is awesome. So even um, you have, uh, you refer to DISC, which, uh, which I love. Um, had a really awesome interview with the gentleman, this guy, Jeremy from um, Gallup, which I love Gallup. And yeah, one that I'm excited about is, uh, uh, which I haven't seen before, is the why. And, um, you know, I can't get into it here, but I, years ago, I went through my low 40s, went through divorce. Our company was in a certain point. I was searching. I came across... Mr. Sinek, I think everybody knows Simon yeah. Sinek today and the Golden Circle and um and you speak not not, not C Y N I C but S I N E K yeah 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 <laughs> no yeah yeah but yeah but I mean that that why it just it just it just hit me right in the head and I was like yeah you know and what I tell everybody what's your why and you know, why is to make money why to support my family why to do this right um, it's five answers down and yeah. and and it is it is another thing it is the same at home and at work. To yep. that find a better way, which is my why, it's the same, right? And, and so people at work the same way would say to me, can you not make this better? Or if you want us to improve what thing, what's the thing you want us to leave alone, right? I, this is why I think this stuff is really important because it 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 can help you well beyond the workplace. So that's, so with that point, going back to the kind of the, the be best you, what I try to do if I remember at the end of the every podcast, because I think there's so many things I want to talk about, but, um, you know, is, you know, not, there's not one thing, but kind of the first thing that pops in your head in order to be an effective leader, you have to be the best version of yourself. And what would you give to somebody that's, you know, on that journey, not trying to figure it out, but like, you know what, I want to be the best version of myself. What do you, what's something that there's a lot, 
but what would you say to kind of round up this, our conversation? Like what's, how do you become the best version of yourself in order to lead others? Uh, yeah, I would start with the spiritual capacity element. I would say, figure out your core values, figure out, and, and, and I've got information in there on how to do it. If you're interested, I have a course on it too, uh, which is at corevaluescourse.com. But to me, it's like, if you're going to build a house, like start with the foundation, you said that before, and this is the foundation, like you, you are going to lead whether you know what these are or not, you are going to lead in line with these, and you're going to be not happy when you're outside of them. So the ability to sort of, I would say it's kind of like driving through a tunnel with the lights off with the, with the same Ferrari, like, you'll either yeah. hit the wall and know you hit the wall, but it's really nice to have the lights on and see the yellow line and not, not, not know you've hit it uh, yeah. and, and before you pull back. So I, I would do that work, because I think it's I, I think it's really the building, keep building block. Um, and then just, just keep learning. Like there's something new every day that I learn or hear or, or otherwise, I think you just got to be a voracious learner. Yeah. That's, thank you. Because today and tomorrow, we actually have them come up with their five core values and kind of, I'll actually uh, mail you and email you the two workbooks that we created. One's called the, uh, uh, my wife and I created a core values workbook that walks yeah. them through um, the process I'll share that with you and then I'll share you are in life view but so what we do just to give you on Monday the class comes in they do this in life view some of them are, why am I doing this I say it's none of my business but it is this exactly person people day? always want to know why they're like what does this have to do with a company yeah yeah and then I say everybody wants to be if you're if you're who you want to be great that doesn't mean you stop working but if you're not and you want to be this person, you don't start doing that. You visit. And then we go into Stephen Covey's habits and we have a whole habit thing and choice and chance and nurture and nature, blah, blah, blah. And then we say, now it's time to start to work on yourself. And we end the week on Friday, ironically, with a vision board, which is kind of almost what you yeah. um, write in here on, in several chapters about how you have people share their accomplishments or whatever, and they become vulnerable. They bring the guards down. We humanize each other. And, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool uh, validation that, you know, what you've done with your company, what, what this, how many books this has sold, how many people have uh, given it the accolades it deserves, but that, uh, you know, like I said all before the conference for me uh, most recently, at a point in my career where I've worked real hard to get to where we are and we're in a good spot. And some of the younger guys are coming up uh, a series of things happened where I was having a hard time letting go. And it's interesting because you had mentioned that a guy you hired is now your COO or CEO. Uh, he's not, he's now the CEO. Yeah. You've kind of, I gave, I gave him my job. Yeah. You took, you stepped aside and you, and I, it was weird because last week I got a call from another guy that I work with. And he said, you'd be proud of these young guys that we worked, that worked for us for a while. And I had been feeling like, where do I fit? Do I matter like this way that, you know, this self-worth that you, you question and a series of things happened. He called me and then rereading your book the other day or today, actually listened to that chapter again on a way to work about how you develop this gentleman he exceeded expectations and then you at some point you got to let him let him do it right <laughs> get, yeah get out of the way yeah and i think that's the thing you know with be best you wherever you are you're starting off your journey you're in the middle of the journey or you're where i am at this point i'm at the end of it by any means but i think that um there's stages that you have to recognize and and do your part and um continue to learn and grow so uh yeah, I, I appreciate it. I knew it was going to be a great conversation and book is awesome. Like I said, um, and you have a lot of little links in here. So you, you provide, so if somebody wants to do something we talked about half of the stuff you you give them the tool and the last ones, do you, I didn't look, but the core values workshop, is that something that you've monetized? Do you charge for that? Or uh, that yeah, there, 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 there's an hour long course. I would say the course is an hour, but the work is an hour and then you get like, an email every week that helps you work okay. through an element for three months okay awesome. so uh yeah that's available you can get on my website robertglazer.com or like i said core values course core that's good yeah and you and you uh you refer to multiple links that get you to the you know the back side of your site as well so yeah um i will share with everybody all those links um in the recap and um i i really appreciate uh 
you know, you coming on and I'm going to get your second book. And the third one, I'm not a remote guy, but interestingly enough, we just were talking to somebody. We had a young lady who was pregnant during and you know, through COVID and is maybe coming back to work. And there's a lot of people through companies yeah, bring back, back to yeah. stay work for virtual. So I'll make sure I get your, uh, your other book about, you know, working virtual and um, share that with people as well. So great. Well, I appreciate you having me. And, yeah, no problem. Uh, and if you can stay on one more minute after, I yeah. would appreciate that. And um, But uh, this is Coach Hughes with Robert uh, Glazer. The book that I have we talked about is Elevate Your Team. He has a book prior to that uh, called Elevate. Um, and uh, I highly recommend you add this to your, your success library. But uh, Coach Hughes would be best podcast. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right.